I'm uh, uh, Robert Kyle from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I started medical school and wanted to be a doctor. During medical school, however, I found that uh, surgeons were rather difficult persons to get along with and uh, preferred the pace of internal medicine. Consequently, I took an internship at a teaching hospital in Chicago and then went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester for my internal medicine training. During that period of time, I was drafted into the Air Force and fortunately was assigned to a large hospital in Alaska and was able to practice internal medicine. What people say about the practice of medicine, it's really true. It's a practice. You learn to interact with patients and to try to apply uh, the science that you have learned in a younger age. At the Mayo Clinic, one had to spend a, a six-month period of time in a laboratory during one's internal medicine training. The options were pathology in which one did autopsies or physiology and at that time it was mainly, mainly cardiovascular physiology but the third option was hematology and I thought about that a bit and uh, decided that I knew less about hematology than anything else. Now during the six months of laboratory experience one had to, in addition to learning the morphology of bone marrow and peripheral blood, one had to do a project. And uh, my project was on acquired hemolytic anemia in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma. And then one had to write up a thesis take an oral, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a written, one had to take a written examination and then one needed to defend his or her thesis at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. My project uh, consisted of these patients with acquired hemolytic anemia and I made the point that many of them had a positive Coombs test and that if one treated them with cortisone that they generally uh, improved and did relatively well. At that time, I was able to read German fluently and I found an article that had been published 50 years before. And in that article, the writer made the statement that uh, uh, acquired hemolytic anemia patients in these conditions did better than the usual patient. I, uh, this took a, a good bit of wind out of my sails and uh, I uh, uh, realized that the only thing that I had done was to really say that uh, these patients had a positive Coombs test which wasn't uh, described until 19 50 or and giving them cortisone which had not been uh, recognized until 1949 and as I said this put me in good stead and made me realize that those people who have preceded us are just as knowledgeable as any Nobel Prize winner today. Uh, nonetheless I finished my laboratory uh, 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 assignment and then I realized that I didn't know anything about hematology from a clinical standpoint. Consequently I took the three-month hematology clinical uh, rotation at uh, uh, St. Mary's Hospital at Mayo Clinic and there two things happened that changed my scientific life. First I saw an electrophoretic pattern for the first time and I asked uh, Dr. Baird, the consultant on the service, what this meant. And he said, well, gee, you know, I really don't know very much about it. Uh, we do see these spikes in patients with multiple myeloma 
and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, why don't you look into it? So I uh, reviewed the 6,500 and some odd uh, patterns that had been done since the test was introduced three years before and uh, came to the conclusion that a spike could be uh, defined as a <clears throat> as a uh, increase in the uh, pattern in which the height uh, was four to one over the width at the midpoint. Uh, today, this doesn't sound like much of a contribution. In fact, it's rather meager. But uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association decided to publish it, and they did. On this same hospital service, a woman was admitted one evening, and uh, she had come to the Mayo Clinic a few days before as an outpatient complaining of fatigue and weakness. To make a long story short, uh, the clinician who saw her made a diagnosis of multiple myeloma and sent her to the hospital service for radiation therapy for her back. However, she had a peculiar uh, change in her skin and the dermatologist did a skin biopsy and the report said amyloid. And so I scratched my head and said, what in the world is that? And all I could remember vaguely uh, was that it was a rather glassy uh, hyaline material that one saw under the microscope and I did not really know that it related to patients. I consequently then looked at the Mayo Clinic records and found uh, 81 patients who had primary systemic amyloidosis over the years and uh, uh, found that uh, many of those had abnormal plasma cells and reported that. Since that time, I've uh, been in hematology and uh, have uh, uh, learned that, uh, that uh, there is always something new to know and to understand. The IWMF is a uh, foundation that is devoted to patients with Holtenstrom's macroglobulinemia. I think that one of the most important things that are done are the fact, or is the fact, that uh, patients who are newly diagnosed, told that they have this disease that they have never heard of before, and furthermore, are told that there is no known cure. Consequently, the patient is very, very uh, disturbed and in many cases depressed. And today they go to the internet and they find the IWMF and read a bit about it. Even more impressively is when one looks at the torch and on the back pages, the last two or three pages of the uh, uh, torch, one sees a list of, of uh, uh, treatments available and then the names of a number of persons from the IWMF who are more than happy to discuss that situation with the newly diagnosed patient. And I've heard on many instances over the years that this has been a very, very unusual and very helpful uh, sort of thing at this time in one's life when one is under a great deal of stress. I'm involved with the International Myeloma Foundation and the Amyloidosis Foundation. And both of those provide educational activities, uh, have hotlines and so forth, but uh, none of them have the person-to-person -person contact of the IWMF. And that, I think, is very, very important. Furthermore, 
the IWMF uh, encourages research and this is very helpful for the young investigator who has difficulty getting financial support for their research. This is particularly important in this day and age when funding has become much more difficult from the National Institutes of Health and particularly the National Cancer Institute. So I am grateful to the IWMF for providing research grants and to get young people, young physicians, young scientists interested in the field and as time goes on uh, a number of those continue with their lifetime work in uh, uh, the treatment of and investigation of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. The future of Waldenstrom's or WM I think is very bright today. There is much more activity in uh, the laboratory and in the pharmaceutical world uh, in efforts to develop new agents for the treatment of this disease. This uh, 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 brings up uh, 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 additional problems in funding, uh, uh, the cost of drugs, the, all of the other things that go with it and make it a very, very challenging time. However, I don't think that the outlook has ever been better for patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia than it is today because we have a variety of agents that are active and helpful and for some patients uh, remissions of long duration occur from the uh, treatment that they receive initially. However, there is no cure today and the patient is at risk for recurrence of the disease and then being treated either with that agent again or with new agents that are being developed uh, all the time. The possibility of cure I think is very, very uh, high and of course if one is to become a little philosophical in this regard one needs only to control the disease until uh, one develops something else. Since the median age of patients with Waldenstrom's is about 70 years there are a lot of other things that can go awry over the next 20 years aside from Waldenstrom's. We have uh, developed a survival curve for patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS, which shows that over a 20 to 25 year period that the risk of dying from one of the plasma cell disorders of which Waldenstrom's is one is actually quite small over this long period of time. If one looks at the survival curve of the individual, the patient who might well have a heart attack, a stroke, other malignancy Relate, unrelated to WM, one sees a curve like this. So, in short, I have never seen anyone get out of this world alive and uh, something is bound to happen to us at one time or another. Thank you very much for your attention.